In this chapter, Mounts chapter 13, we deal with the demonstrative pronouns and adjectives, as well as some other items of Greek grammar. Uh, we're going to begin with the near demonstratives. Demonstratives are forms uh, that in uh, English are usually translated as this or that or these or those. And we can divide our demonstratives between the near demonstratives and the far demonstratives. Near demonstratives are those demonstrative words that uh, have reference to that which is near or closer to the speaker. And that's why this and these are typically used to translate those. And then if we have uh, far demonstratives, then they are more remote or farther away from the speaker. So if the speaker has a pen in uh, his or her hand, uh, the speaker might refer to this pen, but if the pen is in the hand of a student across the room, then the speaker would refer to that pen as that pen instead of this pen. So that's basically the way the demonstratives work. They point out or specify a particular uh, item, usually with respect to nearness or distance. Now we're going to start with the near demonstratives here. So uh, the near demonstratives, th uh, this and these, have regular case endings. Uh, so you're not really going to learn any new case endings with, with these forms. So that's uh, that's encouraging. They're regular case endings. And they're going to follow the forms of the definite article with some exceptions, uh, mi very minor. So I have a chart here below uh, of all the forms of the article uh, in blue. And these are going to be next to the near demonstrative words. And uh, their endings will be blue insofar as those endings reflect the form of the article. So we'll just take a quick look here. So notice my near demonstratives are on the left and my article are on the right. Forms of the article are on the right here. And uh, you'll notice that they pretty much mirror each other. The back side of the near demonstratives will look just like the article except for a few places. And where they differ um, they're not both blue, but rather the differences are in red here. All right, so you'll see that really there's only a few places where that happens in the nominative singular of the masculine and feminine and the nominative plural of the masculine and feminine. Everywhere else, the end half of the near demonstrative is exactly like the article, so they're both in blue there. So it's critically important that you memorize the article, as I've mentioned before. If you do, then you'll know how to parse any form of the near demonstrative pronoun or near demonstrative adjective. Uh, what's also uh, here within the columns of the near demonstrative uh, is uh, that uh, where the beginning of the form differs from the rest, I have made the letters big to draw your attention to it. So if you take a look here, I'll show you that uh, in this place right here, I have a capital alpha here, okay? So, so I'm just drawing your attention to, to this form and to this form right here. These are slightly unexpected forms because uh, if, you, if you notice, the near demonstrative for the feminine singular, this and these, has an owl throughout until you get here. And instead of getting tau tone, which is what I would have expected, you get two tone. Over here, the near demonstrative form of, of the, the neuter usually has an omicron upsilon, ooh, ooh, ooh. But when we get to this nominative plural form, we get ow instead of ooh. And again, that's just a slight deviation from the pattern as you're reading up and down. And of course, in your neuter forms, these are always identical when you have neuter forms, the nominative and the accusative are always the same. So you're going to get that irregularity twice. Okay, so that's just an orientation to the chart. Let's just take a look at the forms of the demonstrative. And uh, what I'll have you do is I will read these and you can repeat after me. And I will give you the uh, pronunciation uh, followed by uh, a translation value. All right, so let's begin with the nominative uh, singular form of the masculine near demonstrative. 
who toss this two two of this two toe to this two ton this plural forms who toy these two tone of these two toys to these and two tooths these now what I want you to notice here is that every form of the demonstrative the near demonstrative here either begins with one of two things it begins either with a rough breathing and a vowel in this case a diphthong or it begins with a towel and therefore since it doesn't begin with a vowel there can't be any breathing mark so those are your two choices the consonant towel in all forms except for where it begins with a vowel and where it does it is a rough breathing okay and pretty much the beginning is always two except for that rough breathing for those two forms now for the feminine form of the near demonstrative let's read these how te this it's a feminine this tau taste of this tau te to this tau tame this and then fem plural feminine plural how tie these two tone of these tau ties to these tau toss these our case endings are all very normal but again notice that in all the forms of the near demonstrative feminine, they begin with a tau every time, except for these same two places as we saw. We have the ones that begin with a vowel are the nominative ones, and instead of the tau, they have a vowel plus a rough breathing. Now these are diphthongs, oo and ow. These are diphthongs. And as diphthongs, remember, we're only placing accent marks and breathing marks over the second member of the diphthong. Okay, and then this is that unexpected Omicron where I've got alphas all the way throughout. So two tone, two tone. And then on to the neuter form. Notice that the neuter form, you'd normally expect a new here. But as in some other neuter forms, this simply takes no ending. So the stem vowel is omicron, no case ending is used, and the accusative singular will look just like the nominative singular. Okay, so let's read these. Tuta, this, tutu, of this, tuto, to this, tuta, this, and then on the plural side, we have tauta, these two tone of these two toys to these tauta these again notice we have the large alpha here to indicate that this is unexpected we're having two 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 all the way throughout but when we get here we have tauta tauta okay so remember your your noun rules Nominative and accusative neuter forms are always identical to each other, so those will be the same. And also, remember that masculine and neuter are the same forms, at least the same endings, in the genitive and the dative. And uh, that's true here, isn't it? And here. It's also true up here in the singular. Two two in the neuter matches two two over here, and two toe matches two toe. So we have identical forms there. And uh, again, our neuters are the same in the nominative and the accusative. So this is in keeping with our rule. Well, let's go down to the next handout. 
there's one thing that we need to say about the near demonstratives, and that is that there are some places where one might get confused as to um, the forms, and, and that happens right here. Remember, we have this third person personal pronoun altas, and the masculine form of altas, and the masculine near demonstrative. So remember, hutas means this, altas as a pronoun means he. You should not get these confused. They do not look the same at all. They have the same endings. As you notice, who toss, al toss, to to al to, right? The the toss to toe, toss to toe, and so forth. Those are similar, but the front end is very much different. There should be no confusion here. Where the confusion can happen is on the feminine form. If you notice, the near demonstrative for this feminine thing is how te, and the third person pronoun she is al te. Okay, so notice we have a rough breathing right here, and the accent is on the first syllable. How te, this, this feminine singular thing. How te. For the pronoun she, smooth breathing, and the accent is not on the first syllable, but on the second one. Ow te. Ow te. So, how te, this. Al te. All right, and then over here we have one more possibility. All of the letters are identical. It's just a matter of difference of breathing and accent. How tai is these feminine plural, and al tai with a smooth breathing. Uh, oops, it's not she, it's they, but it's a female they. Accent on the second syllable. Okay. Aside from those two places, you should be able to tell the difference. Uh, in the third person pronoun, the forms are always smooth breathing with ow, right? Ow, 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 Sounds like somebody's beating me up. Okay? Near demonstratives, we have how, how. Okay, but aside from that, the near demonstratives are always going to start with a tau. Okay? Tau taste, tau te, tau ting. So if you ever have a tau, you know it's not the third person pronoun, uh, no matter what. So it's only these forms that don't get the tau, and only the feminine ones, where they end up looking almost the same. Okay, so we have to pay, pay very careful attention to that. All right. Let's take a look at the far demonstratives in Greek. In Greek, we have the far demonstratives that could be translated that or those. And uh, these are like the near demonstratives in that they have regular 2 1 2 case endings. Those uh, case endings that we saw with hu tas, hau te, and tu ta, those are 2 1 2 endings as well. They follow second declension, first declension, second declension. Uh, so we have that here. Uh, so there's nothing unusual about this. These words will not be confused with anything. Uh, they're fairly easy to identify, and, uh, and they follow standard declension patterns. So let's read the forms and uh, look at the translation value of these. First of all, we have the masculine forms for the far demonstrative, and they are, repeat after me, akainos, meaning that, akainu, of that, akaino, to that, Akanon, that, plural forms, akanoi, those, akanon, of those, akanois, to those, akanus, those, functioning as something like a direct object. Feminine forms, let's take a look here. We have, first of all, akane, that's that, that feminine thing, ekenes, of that, ekene, to that, ekenein, that. All of these are the standard first declension case endings that you've come to know and love and cherish. Plural forms, ekenai, those, ekenon, of those, ekenais, to those, ekenas, 
those. And then the neuter forms. And again, just as in the uh, near demonstrative and the words uh, like alas, uh, we have no case ending in the neuter nominative singular or accusative singular. Uh, we either get a new for the neuter nominative or we get no case ending at all. And uh, this is following the no case ending strategy. So we've now seen this a number of times. Let's uh, repeat. Ekena, that. Ekenu, of that. Ekeno, to that. Ekena, that. And then the plural forms. Ekena, those. Ekenon, of those. Ekenois, to those. And Ekena, those. Well, those are the near and far demonstratives. Now, if you take a look at this next handout that I've uh, created for you, what I'm going to do is walk through uh, what the characteristics of these demonstratives are. Okay, so we've learned how to form them, how to identify them. We want to make sure we know how to parse them and translate them properly. Uh, but now I want to talk about how we might see these demonstratives in actual words or sentences. So let's, uh, let's look here at the handout. Um, 13.7 in Mounts, that's page 108, uh, the pronoun function of the demonstratives. What we're going to see is that demonstrative words can function in one of two ways. They can either function as pronouns or as adjectives. Okay? So you can have them uh, functioning one way or the other, either as pronouns or as adjectives. We'll start with the pronoun function first. When the demonstratives function as pronouns, then there's no noun that it's going to accompany or agree with in case, gender, and number. That is to say, it functions itself as a noun functions. That's what pronouns do. Pronouns do what nouns do because pronouns stand in for nouns. They replace nouns and fulfill all the functions that a noun fills. So if we take a look at these examples, uh, I give, so give you uh, two English examples, uh, just using the demonstrative word as a pronoun, okay? So look at this first example. This really stinks. I have a subject, this, and then stinks is my verb and really is my adverb. But notice that the demonstrative word this is functioning the way a noun would function because nouns are typically subjects. And this is the subject. This is uh, what stinks. Uh, notice there's no noun that this is modifying. Okay, this is the noun for all intents and purposes. But it is a pronoun. Now look at the second example. I love those. I is the subject. Love is the verb. And notice that the demonstrative word those is my direct object. That is typically a noun function. Here the pronoun is functioning like a noun. Notice, again, I have no noun that goes with those. It's not, I love those turkeys. It's just, I love those. But these, there's my demonstrative pronoun, uh, are attractive. And I have a, uh, an adjective here, that's a predicate adjective. Uh, again, these is functioning as a demonstrative pronoun. Here it's fulfilling a noun function, okay? Uh, over here, in Greek, I've given you two sentences. Hutoi, here's my near demonstrative, it's nominative, plural, and masculine. Hutoi agaposin ton iesun. Uh, this is functioning as my subject. Okay, These, masculine plural, love Jesus. These what? Well, it's not specified. The these is just simply standing for a noun. In this case, it's the demonstrative pronoun function of the demonstrative. These love Jesus. But because it's a masculine plural form of these, in English, I could put these men, these people, these ones, or just simply these love Jesus. But Greek tells me a little bit more than English does as to the gender of the these. Over here, I have hi Jesus agapa ekenus. Jesus, my subject, 
agapa, love. And here the demonstrative word is functioning as a pronoun. And uh, it's the direct object. Notice I have the accusative, uh, plural, and masculine form here. So Jesus loves those. This is the far demonstrative. Jesus loves those, masculine, plural, entities. So I could simply say Jesus loves those, or Jesus loves those men, or Jesus loves those, loves those people. So <clears throat> when demonstratives function as pronouns, they're going to have to have a gender and a number. What will determine that gender and number? That gender and number is going to be determined by the pronoun's referent or antecedent. That is to say, what does the pronoun stand for? Whatever the pronoun stands for, that referent will have a gender and a number, and the pronoun will have to take that gender and number. Now, what's going to determine the case of the demonstrative pronoun? Well, that's easy. The case of any pronoun is determined by its grammatical function within the clause it sits in. So over here, because who toy is functioning as the subject, it has to be what case? Nominative, exactly. And because a canus is the direct object, what case must it be in? Well, it must be in the accusative case. Now, when we're translating a demonstrative pronoun, sometimes it will be useful to add an additional word to clarify the gender and number of the pronoun, since in English, our demonstrative words are not marked for gender. Now, under 13.8, we see that there's also an adjectival function for the demonstrative. The demonstrative word could also be an adjective. When the demonstrative word functions as an adjective, then there will be a noun that it accompanies and agrees with in case, gender, and number. This is very important. We saw this with normal attributive adjectives. When an adjective modifies a noun, the adjective will be juxtaposed with that noun. It'll be side by side with it, and it will agree with that noun in case, gender, and number. However, the demonstrative adjective will be in the predicate position. It's going to be in the predicate position. What, what does that mean? If you go back and review, I'll just tell you, you may need to go back and review this. It's when you have an anarthrous adjective juxtaposed with an articular noun. That is to say, I could have something like uh, ha anthropos, um, ha anthropos agathos, or agathos ha anthropos. Agathos is my adjective. It is anarthrous, no article. But the uh, noun will have the article. Okay, so. That's predicate position. Although it's not going to be in the attributive position where it has the article immediately before the adjective, we are going to translate it as if it were attributive, just as we saw when we used pas, pasa, and pon, the words for all or every. And then finally, the case, gender, and number of the demonstrative adjective will be determined by the case, gender, and number of the noun it modifies. This is always true for attributive adjectives. So let's take a look at some examples here. And I'm using very similar examples to what I used before when we were speaking of the demonstratives as pronouns. First example, this foot really stinks. Uh, my previous example was simply this really stinks. But notice now, this has an, a noun that it accompanies. And in Greek, it would agree with it in case, gender, and number. Uh, since foot would be the subject, then the form of this would also have to match the nominative case form. Okay, foot would be singular, and so this would be singular, and so forth. So it's not just this stinks, but this foot, this noun, really stinks. Number uh, two here. I love those toes. Notice that toes is being modified by the demonstrative adjective. So there's a noun that it accompanies that agrees with it in case, gender, number. I hear it would be accusative case because it'd be the direct object. I love those toes, but these toes are unattractive. Notice these is accompanied by another noun that it would agree with in case, gender, and number. Now over here I have the Greek examples. So repeat after me. 
hutoi hoi apostoloi agaposen tan iesun. So I have hutoi, which is nominative masculine plural. Okay. And that is uh, right beside hoi apostoloi, which is also nominative masculine and plural. Notice that the article is in front of the noun, but the article is not in front of the adjective, the demonstrative adjective. This is the predicate position. Okay. Now, that does not mean that this is a predicate use of the pronoun. It's not what we're saying. We're saying that it is just in the predicate position because that's what this type of adjective requires. It requires a predicate position just like the adjectives pas, pas, upon. We are going to translate it as if it were attributive. So it's not these are the apostles. It's simply which apostles? These apostles. These apostles love Jesus. Okay? Now, on the other side here, number four, I have Ha Jesus now as the subject, not the object, and he's doing the loving. Jesus loves, and now I have my demonstrative word, a canus, juxtaposed with a noun, with its article, okay? All of these agree in case, gender, and number. They are accusative, plural, and masculine. All of them are, but there is no article in front of a canus. It is in the predicate position, which is what I'm looking for with my demonstrative. And I'm going to translate it, though, as if it were attributive. Jesus loves which apostles? These. Excuse me. Those apostles. It's the far demonstrative. Jesus loves those apostles. So that's how we're going to see the demonstratives uh, functioning. Uh, those are the two most common. Now, in 13.9, we also see we also see one um, other use of the demonstrative, and this is where the demonstrative can sometimes be used or at least translated as if it were a personal pronoun. Sometimes the demonstrative force of the pronoun is diminished to the point where, in English, it's appropriate to use a personal pronoun with anaphoric reference. Anaphoric simply means backward referring. If something, a pronoun is anaphoric, it's referring backwards to something or someone previously mentioned in the context. So if I said, for example, once upon a time there was a princess and she was beautiful, she is a pronoun referring backwards to the princess as the previously established referent. So, Sometimes we have demonstratives that function this way, as, for example, in John 5, 6, where it says, and when Jesus saw Teuton, we could translate that as when Jesus saw this one, but most of our English translations simply translate this as a personal pronoun, and when Jesus saw him. So there that demonstrative seems to have lost its demonstrative force. John 8, 44, Jesus begins talking about the devil as the devil relates to the uh, the Jews that he's speaking with. He says to them, who may sect to patros to diabolu este? And you from your father the devil are, and then he makes a comment about the devil, a kainos, anthropos, Anthropoctonos ain apar case. So he, notice that's how that's being translated. You could say that one, but he, a murderer, was from the beginning. So don't be surprised if sometimes you see demonstrative pronouns being translated just like a simple personal pronoun. In 13.10, we are introduced to a new case. It is the fifth of the cases and the least frequently occurring of the cases. This is called the vocative case. 
and it's used to name the addressee in a dialog. It names the addressee. Uh, in English grammar, we call such nouns the noun of direct address. So vocative case names the addressee. But basically, how do you form the vocative case? Basically, the vocative forms are the same as the nominative. So you, you won't always be able to tell the difference. There are some exceptions, though, where there actually is a distinct form for the vocative. And so uh, Mounts points out that plural forms in the vocative are the same as plural forms in the nominative, and the singular first declension, typically feminine noun, is the same in the nominative and the vocative. So I didn't want to write that down, uh, but, uh, but here is where we do see a difference. Second declension singular nouns. These are the ones that have stems that end with omicron, right? Omicron stems. Second declension singular nouns replace the os with the epsilon. All right. So in Luke 520, when um, Jesus is addressing a man, he addresses the man as man. Anthrope, you're used to anthro what? Anthropos, right? You usually see the os after the p. Notice I have an epsilon here. Anthrope, man, talking to you. Man, your sins are forgiven you. Then we have some third declension singular nouns where usually the bare stem of the noun is used. That is to say there's no case ending attached and the sometimes with vowel gradation or ablaut. So take a look at Matthew 6, 9. This is the Lord's Prayer. We have pater, hemon, Ha entois or anois. Our Father who is in heaven. Vocative. Okay. Our Father is the addressee. Uh, what's different here? Well, compare pater with the lexical form. Pater, we have an eta, right? Eta is a long vowel. Epsilon, on the other hand, is short. So we have gone from a long lexical form to a short vowel here. And so that is vowel gradation or ablaut. So my vocative form is slightly different. Okay, so uh, you will have vocative forms pointed out to you as you come across them in your reading. Um, it, again, is not a very common uh, case ending, so uh, you really don't need to worry about it too much. Now, 13.11 through 13 are just some odds and ends that Mount introduces you to. So I'm going to give you a little bit more uh, detail here, uh, just slightly more uh, on some of these matters. So 13.11, we have uh, this matter of degree of adjectives. What do I mean by that? Hmm. Adjectives can be used to indicate degree, namely that some entity, some participant in... In, uh, in the discourse, uh, bears some adjectival quality more or less in relation to others. So if I'm comparing two things, I could say that Johnny is, um, you know, happier than Billy. So Johnny and Billy are being compared with respect to, to, to the quality of happy. If I wanted to, and that would be comparative, if I wanted to talk about Johnny just uh, without reference to anyone else's having that quality, I would use the, the positive form, just happy. So happy, comparative, happier. And if I wanted to say that Johnny is happy in relation to everybody else, then I would use the superlative form, happiest. Now, uh, these are the forms of degree, positive, comparative, and superlative. So there are three of these uh, in English as, as in Greek. In Greek, um, there's nothing special about forming the positive. That's just the normal form of the adjective. To form the comparative, which you're typically going to see happen, is that under normal conditions, the, uh, the, uh, the ending or the morpheme teros, which would be masculine, terra, teron, uh, that would be added uh, to the adjective to make it comparative. And then the superlative is going to um, add tatas or istos 
for uh, saying more or, or excuse me, most or the blankest, uh, whatever the adjective might be. Okay, so those are our standard ways to do it. I'm going to give you four examples of the degrees of the adjective, too regular, too irregular. So let's take a look at these. Let's take mikras, first of all. The, 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 the positive form is mikras, small. To say smaller, I change mikras to mikrateras. So I'm adding that teras ending. I drop that case ending, add the uh, morpheme teras. A morpheme is is a um, is a meaningful unit of a word that has it's it's some some unit of a word that has meaning. Here, this is the uh, the comparative morpheme. I'll let go ahead and jot that down. You've probably seen this word, morpheme. Okay, so a morpheme is terra, and then the sigma is the is the case ending now. Okay, so mikrateras smaller, and then mikrateras is smallest. So there's the tata the ending there. Now paneras, the positive form, as if we could speak of evil being positive. Uh, so there's paneras, evil. Paneroteras, eviler. That probably sounds evil just to say eviler. Many of you would like to say more evil, but this is also a, a form that's used. And then paneratatas evilest or the most evil now these next two are irregular forms and this is the one that mounts gives you in this chapter but i wanted to give you the regular forms uh, as well as the irregular one here and then one more that you'll run into in the greek new testament and there's other irregular forms you'll meet them as you go uh, here's the the adjective megas this is the masculine form by the way megas is large Made zone is larger. Notice this is under the irregular column because not only is my stem changing, but also I'm not using the teros ending here, am I? So made zone is larger and megastas is largest. Largest. And then agathos is the adjective good. That's the positive. Kraison, better. There's an alternate spelling with the double tau, so kraton, so kraton or kraton, better, and then kratistas, best. So that is a sampling of degree. Under section 13.12 on page 110, we're introduced to the concept of crassus. Maltz doesn't really talk much about this. He just introduces you uh, to the idea of there being such a thing. Uh, but but crassus is the contraction of a vowel or a diphthong at the end of one word with the vowel or diphthong at the beginning of another word. So we're going to see these two words sort of crash together. Crassus means mingling. Uh, so they're going to sort of crash together. Vowel at the end of one, vowel at the beginning of another. They're going to create one uh, orthographical word now and then there's going to be a diacritical mark above the contracted vowel and it's called a coronis when it looks like a smooth rough breathing excuse me a, a smooth breathing mark okay the, the word coronis here means hook so <clears throat> I'm going to give you three examples of of crests there's more mounts up points to uh, page 342 in his textbook if you want to see more examples of this but we have chi and a go together we're going to see the squeeze here right and this is going to be written as ka go ka go and notice there's the coronas right there okay that is a separate diacritic mark from the apostrophe of the rough breathing chi amoy becomes ka moy so the front part looks the same, back part looks the same, okay, but we've got contraction here in the middle. And then Kai Akenos becomes Ka Kenos. Ka Kenos. So there's a, your example of Crassus.
the last item of our uh, chapter here has to do with the adjective uh, much or many. And uh, this adjective is a little bit unusual. It is not so unusual that you can't parse it. Okay? Uh, but the word for much or many is, uh, our, these are our three forms, palus, pale, palu. Uh, it follows a, uh, a 2 one two pattern, except, except for four forms that are unusual. Okay? What we see is you look at the forms, just let your eye look, look down, you'll notice that all the forms of this adjective have a double lambda, except for where the highlighted yellow is. Which forms are those? Well, they're masculine and neuter forms in the nominative and the accusative. Okay? These have a single lambda and then an upsilon. All right? Now, the case ending is normal. Sigma, nu. Right? That's nominative and that's accusative for your typical second declension. Over here, remember, we usually get a nu in the neuter, but... A lot of times that's missing and that's the case here so there's no neuter case ending used at all and remember the neuters are always identical in the nominative and the accusative so aside from these four places uh, we have a double lambda okay this is following two one two pattern aside from those four crazy forms all right so let me just have you uh, repeat after me we'll read these forms together Going down the masculine column, palus, palu, palo, paloon, paloi, palon, palois, palus. Feminine forms, pale, palais, pale, paling, palai, palon, palois, palais. Ah, that should be palais, not palois. We need to change that to an alpha. Okay, so palice. And then the neuter forms. Palu, palu, palo, palu. Plural forms. Pala, palone, palois, pala. All right, there you go. That is chapter 13.